only mode for the duration of today's presentation. Today's call is also being recorded. If anyone has any objections, you may disconnect at this time. And I will now turn the call over to Ms. Jane Segebrecht. Thank you. You may begin. Great. Thank you very much. And welcome to the audience today. Um, we know that some folks are still trickling on, but we're going to go ahead and get started. We're so glad that everyone is able to join us today. This is Jane Segerbrecht, um, and thank you on behalf of HRSA, Office of Women's Health, for joining um, this webinar, Sheltering in Place, Intimate Partner Violence, and the Healthcare Response. Uh, today's event is hosted by three partners from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. This includes the Health Resources and Her Services Administration, HRSA, Office of Women's Health, the HRSA Regional Office of Regional Operations, Region 9, and the Administration for Children and Families, Family and Youth Services Bureau, Family Violence Prevention Services Program, or FIPSA. Next slide. We are hosting today's event as part of National Women's Health Week. This week serves as a reminder for women and girls, especially during the outbreak of COVID-19 or the COVID-19 public health emergency, to make their health a priority and to take care of themselves. Um, during today's webinar, you'll learn about practical approaches to support your organization and your response to COVID-19. And our first presentation will be from Futures Without Violence. Um, Futures is a national leader on the intersection of health and domestic violence. And we'll then hear from um, a frontline provider perspective um, from Dr. Kimberly Chang of Asian Health Services, a HRSA supported health center based in Oakland, California. And just a few housekeeping items at the start. Um, please feel free to type your name and your organization that you're joining us from today into the chat box. Um, we will not have a formal question and answer section. Um, so if you have any questions as the webinar proceeds, please type them in the chat box and we'll try to respond to you individually. Um, if you would like to download today's slides and resources, please refer to the file pod, um, which is in the lower right-hand corner of your screen. And in the event that there are connection issues, we encourage everyone to download the slides at the start of today's presentation, and that way you can follow along individually if you need. So I will now pass it over to our first speaker, Commander Nancy Matoni-Smith, the Acting Director of the HRSA Office of Women's Health. Next slide. Thank you, Jane. Uh, good afternoon. This is Commander Nancy Maltoni-Smith, and I'm the Acting Director of the HRSA Office of Women's Health. And on behalf of HRSA and the Office of Women's Health, I wish to welcome you to this webinar, Sheltering in Place, Intimate Partner Violence, and the Healthcare Response. I'd like to personally thank HRSA OWH staff, Jane Segebrecht and Jessica Titel, the Office of Regional Operations staff, Captain Nibby Jane and Katrina Sango, for their work to make today's webinar happen. I'd also like to thank our federal partners from the HHS Office on Women's Health and the Administration for Children and Families, Family Violence Prevention and Services Program, especially Kenya Fairley and Commissioner Elizabeth Darling, along with ACF's grantee, Futures Without Violence, who will be presenting much of the content today. HRSA's programs provide a wide range of health services to people who are geographically isolated economically or medically vulnerable, and we fund more than 3,000 awardees and serve tens of millions of people every year, including those living with HIV and AIDS, pregnant women, mothers and their families, and those otherwise unable to access quality health care. Next slide, please. HRSA's reach, Office of Regional Operations has been critical to advancing HRSA's violence prevention work, as their national network of 10 regional offices strive to increase access to quality care, information, and resources through outreach convening and monitoring of emerging regional and state trends. Their engagement with regional and local stakeholders was a key catalyst that led to this webinar today. During this public health emergency, individuals and communities face unprecedented stress, and there have been numerous reports of increased intimate partner violence across the nation. Fortunately, there are resources that can help healthcare providers respond to domestic violence, support victims experiencing abuse, and promote resiliency in children in a public health emergency. And with that, I'm very pleased to introduce our next speaker, Elizabeth Darling, Commissioner of the Administration on Children, Youth, and Families. 
Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us on this webinar today, and thank you, Commander Malcolm Smith, for the introduction. I'm Elizabeth Darling, Commissioner of the Administration on Children, Youth, and Families. We are housed under the umbrella of the Administration for Children and Families here at HHS. In ACYF, we address an array of different issues involving children, youth, and families, and engage in robust research and evaluation to inform our work. In our programs, we address the intersecting issues of child welfare, domestic violence, homeless youth, and prevention of teen pregnancy. I'm happy to share remarks today about the Family Violence Prevention and Services Act program. Next slide, please. Congress first passed the Family Violence Prevention and Services Act as part of the Child Abuse Amendments of 1984. FIPSA made history by being the first federal resource dedicated specifically to expand and support domestic violence shelter services and programs. After 35 years of significant efforts to meet the needs of survivors of domestic violence in accomplishing significant systems change work, FIPSA remains unique. FIPSA supports community-driven solutions to address domestic violence and promotes partnerships among FIPSA-funded programs with community-based agencies, services, and support. FIPSA serves millions of victims or survivors each year through our grants to shelters, community-based programs, tribes, and hotlines. The majority of those served receive non-residential services such as advocacy, support groups, legal or housing assistance. Next slide, please. Should be slide seven. Thank you. FIPSA provides funding for state domestic violence coalitions and for a network of training and technical assistance resource centers and culturally specific institutes, the National Domestic Violence Hotline and the Strong Hearts Native Helpline. Community connectedness is a social determinant of health, and specifically, it is a protective factor against domestic violence. With FIPSA funding going out to over 1,600 domestic violence shelters, programs, and tribes, this network of technical assistance providers helps us build resilient communities and supports the healing of survivors and their children. With greater community and social network, the less likely women are to experience domestic violence or to return to an abusive partner. My vision is that every community has a multidisciplinary, community-based, trauma-informed, integrated system of care. Working together at the federal and state levels to leverage resources and expertise helps us bring that vision to life. Next slide, please. Our federal partnership with HRSA's Office of Women's Health and the HRSA Bureau of Primary Health Care through the implementation of Project Catalyst is an excellent example of leveraging federal and state resources to affect practice and policy change. Project Catalyst, Statewide Transformation on Health and Intimate Partner Violence, is focused on fostering collaboration around domestic violence, sexual violence, human trafficking, and health leadership at the state and community level to improve health and safety outcomes for survivors. You can see the states and territories that have been engaged in phases one, two, and three of Project Catalyst. We are currently modifying implementation of phase three due to the current COVID-19 public health emergency. These state and territorial leadership teams work together to promote state-level policy and systems changes, to engage community health centers and victim advocacy programs to partner with one another on trauma-informed practice transformation, to integrate universal education about intimate partner violence 
and human trafficking response into healthcare delivery statewide, and to train HRSA-funded public health clinics in their respective state or territory. And now I'd like to hand it over to our presenters from Futures Without Violence. We are very proud of the work the Health Resource, Service, the Health Resource Center on Domestic Violence has done with Project Catalyst, among other key health systems change. And we also value the great work being done by the Promising Futures Children's Services Capacity Building Team. The next person you'll hear from is Anna Moriabi. Anna? Thank you, Commissioner Darling, and thank you, Commander Mountone Smith, for that introduction and for your leadership in this work. And I'd also like to extend thanks to Jane Segebrecht and Kenya Fairley, Jessica Titel, Dr. Jane, and Katrina Songo for organizing today's webinar and giving us this opportunity to present. So good afternoon, everyone, and hello from San Francisco. I'm Anna Mariavi. I'm a program director at Futures Without Violence. Our headquarters are in San Francisco. And I'm joined today by several of my future colleagues that you can see on the top of the slide. Anissa and I work with our FISBE funded National Health Resource Center on Domestic Violence that Commissioner Darling was just talking about. And Mie and Leana work with our Promising Futures Capacity Building Center, which focuses on strategies for children and families experiencing domestic violence. So you'll hear from the four of us today, and also on the bottom of the slide, you'll also hear from Dr. Kimberly Chang, who is a family physician and human trafficking and healthcare policy fellow at Asian Health Services. She's also vice speaker of the House for the executive board of directors for the National Association of Community Health Centers. So today, uh, the five of us are going to share strategies to promote safety, support, and health access for survivors of intimate partner violence and human trafficking, and also for their children. We'll have some pointers for parents as well um, in the time of COVID-19. So I'm going to pass it now to my colleague, Leana, who's going to tell us more about the impact of COVID-19 on survivors of violence, trauma, and abuse. Great. Thanks, Anna. Good afternoon, everyone, or morning, depending on where you are in the world. Um, my name is Leanna Kanika, and I'm a program director at Futures Without Violence. I'm actually based in our Boston office and work on the children and youth team. I want to start my presentation off by saying thank you. Thank you to all of you on the line for the, your work you are doing every day to support families and help folks be healthy and safer. We know that community health clinics and DV programs are on the front lines of this crisis. And you all are implementing creative and innovative strategies to provide critical services for families. Programs are open and ready to help, and for that, I'm so thankful. I've heard stories of DV advocates wearing purple scarves at the local grocery store and partnering with essential businesses to put safety cards in shopping bags. Programs are thinking of new ways to get the word out that there is help available. Advocates are writing messages on pizza boxes. Clinicians are using the chat function during telehealth to avoid being overheard by abusive family members. Innovation and shape shifting are happening all over in response to this crisis. Next, I wanna provide some context for the concrete strategies my colleagues will share a little later. COVID-19 has changed our entire world. It has upended life as we know it, from how we work, play, and live. No corner of our world has been untouched by this public health crisis. Many have lost loved ones, and so many are struggling financially and emotionally as we all try to embrace this new reality. I know for me, I have two small children, a three-and-a-half-year-old and an eight-month-old with an underlying health condition. Trying to keep them safe, do my work, manage anxiety, and keep the house together has been overwhelming. I know many of you on this webinar can relate. And when we turn our attention to survivors of family violence, we all know COVID-19 has made everyday survival that much more difficult. It has intensified isolation and so, and so many of the dynamics that perpetuate violence. It has also put a spotlight on many systemic and social inequalities that have always been there. COVID-19 has had tremendous impact on people surviving violence, including children and youth. Survivors may no longer be able to leave home for work and they may be stuck at home with their abusers. Children may be home with the person who is sexually assaulting them. Parents are now trying to take care of kids, homeschool, and maintain an income. Children are, who often thought of school or activities as safe havens no longer have access. It may even be difficult to reach out to friends or other support networks. 
The increased stress and proximity to the person using harm may also intensify the abuse. Systemic inequities are contributing to increased burdens for marginalized and oppressed communities. There is an increased likelihood of having chronic health conditions due to the social determinants of health and a higher likelihood of being laid off or working a lower paying job with little time off and lack of access to childcare. We know from the data that indigenous and black and brown families are faring the worst right now with the disproportionately high numbers of COVID-19 cases. All of these factors increase burden, stress, and trauma on adult and child survivors. We are also hearing mixed information from the field about rates of DV and child abuse. In some states and communities, the reports are down. In some, numbers are up. This can be attributed to several factors. Many people are isolated, more so than ever. Our systems are often set up for surveillance and monitoring, and those entry points and many safety nets aren't as readily available, such as schools, workplaces, community activities, healthcare. This can drive reports down. Some states are sharing lower rates of child abuse reports, but an increase in hospital visits for major injuries for children. We are also hearing about increased calls to the DV hotline, and for RAIN, or the Rape, Abuse, and Incest National Network, calls are way up for March and April. They report that over 50% of the calls were from minors. They were asking for help and information, sometimes making disclosures, and many were actually asking for information for peers they were worried about. This suggests that violence is escalating and increasing for many, pointing to the need for us to get creative in our responses across all forms of violence. Next slide. Another slice to this issue is human trafficking and the increased risk during this crisis. Trafficking is an issue that affects the most vulnerable people, those with disparities related to health, housing, food, disability, immigration status, income, racial, sexual, gender discrimination, and others. LGBTQ youth who experience homelessness are at a higher risk for sex trafficking and sexual exploitation. Traffickers prey on children who have minimal social support. Children experiencing violence at home, homelessness, or those who are in foster care who have limited networks to turn to in times of stress are particularly at risk. When you add in the current circumstances of COVID-19, things get much harder. We are hearing from advocates that youth who are aging out of foster care and who are relying on housing through college have had those supports ripped away. The sheltering in place rules have limited options such as staying with friends or extended family. This can lead to a rise in survival sex work. Housing insecurity and job loss leads to increased vulnerability to trafficking. With everyone staying at home, there's increased online activity for all of us and this increases predatory recruitment by traffickers. With increased stress and violence at home, more youth are thinking about or are actually running away, also making them more vulnerable. So next slide. What can we do in the face of this? I wanna offer some principles that we have developed as an organizing framework, as a humble offering to programs and advocates to inform their policy practice and program design. These nine principles were extracted from the research and literature on trauma, adversity, and resilience. The principles are designed to support strategies that reduce stress and burden on children and families, especially those experiencing violence. We have been talking to a lot of groups about these, so we offer these for your consideration as you innovate and develop strategies. You know your systems and communities the best and can use these as a guide to develop solutions. Consider what you're already doing how they apply to these principles, and how you could use these to expand your strategies. Reduce burden and stress. Enable positive family interaction, so between a child parent, sibling, sibling. Prioritize safer and more stable living conditions. Promote equity. We have seen just how inequitable our current systems and responses are. This is one that should really drive our efforts and distribution of resources. Encourage predictability and harm reduction along with healthy social and spiritual community connections. Next slide. Can folks still hear me? Yes. Yes, okay, great. All right, thank you. Um, build and practice core life skills with children and families, including, pro including problem solving and planning, growth mindset, physical and emotional regulation, and incremental goal setting. We hope to encourage you all to move beyond creating awareness or teaching these, but to create the actual conditions that help people use and practice them. 
It's important to set small goals and not overwhelm folks. This builds agency. Limit restrictions. It's time to check ourselves. Which rules and policy, policies can we ease up on or change to support family agency and increase safety? Foster joy. All people, not just children, need to have positive experiences. It's not just about reducing stress and burden, but creating joy and fun for family. Collaborate with others. Everything's hyper-local right now. Look for partnerships in your community, libraries, schools, food banks, online neighborhood parent communities, grocery stores, and others. These principles are about supporting families to take the actions they believe will help them, not what maybe we believe will help or make them jump through hoops to reach us. To wrap up my section, I want to thank you all again for all the work you do and hope these principles to provide a frame for your practice innovation. Now I'll hand it off to my colleague, Anissa, who will share more. Thank you. Thank you, Liana. So as many of you already know, um, most community health centers and DV advocacy programs remain open and continue to support survivors and their children during this public health emergency, whether that's in person or virtually. Health centers are one of the few places that people are still allowed to go, even with shelter in place restrictions. And many are also being um, seen via telehealth, seeing patients via telehealth. So health centers in a sense are really uniquely positioned to support survivors. Many DV advocacy programs also continue to operate and have adapted their services to meet the needs of survivors and their children during this time. So we'll be highlighting some key services offered by each setting, and we'll also walk through the benefits of community health center and DV program partnerships. Next slide, please. So DV programs often serve as primary referrals for both domestic violence and trafficking survivors. Um, in fact, for many survivors of trafficking, they may contextualize their experiences within the context of relationships, for example, referring to them as a boyfriend, daddy, or husband. And domestic violence advocates really have the know-how to work with and support all survivors through immediate and long-term safety planning and making survivors aware of the unique legal, criminal, and housing supports that are available to them. Some communities may also have human trafficking specific programs, um, which are often embedded within criminal justice systems. So folks can assess what's available in individual communities and can expand their partnerships. Also folks should become familiar with the current operations and hours for, for DV programs in their area. And um, so while DV services are up and running, some operational protocols may have shifted due to the current public health emergency. So for example, in some states, DV programs are now housing survivors in hotel rooms if they've been exposed to COVID-19 rather than um, in their shelter. And then in other states, um, support groups are being held virtually rather, in, rather than in person. And next slide, please. So federally funded community health centers are both community-based and patient-directed organizations and they provide services regardless of a patient's ability to pay. Um, and they also charge for services on a sliding fee scale. They deliver comprehensive primary care and also often include a pharmacy, mental health services, substance abuse programs, oral health services, and pregnancy, pre, uh, perinatal and postpartum care. Community health centers also have supportive services such as health education, language translation, and transportation that promote access to health care. And then some health centers also focus on special populations, including those experiencing homelessness, um, migratory and seasonal agricultural workers, and residents of public housing. And they are also located in areas where um, economic, geographic, or cultural barriers limit access to affordable health care services. So you can actually use the Find a Health Center tool on, up on the screen, um, and that, that can help you locate um, the health center that's closest to you. And next slide, please. So we've talked about what both health centers and DV programs each offer survivors, and we also want to emphasize how formalizing partnerships between the two can really be instrumental to support survivor health and promote safety in a coordinated way. Health centers and DV advocacy programs have shared health and safety goals, and they both serve clients at increased risk for COVID-19. For example, those that are living in close quarters with others, 
people who are experiencing homelessness, elders, people with chronic health issues, and those who are immune compromised, um, for example, people living with HIV. And um, our goal with DV advocacy programs and health center partnerships is to develop and enhance these relationships and build bidirectional warm referrals to increase health access and promote safety. This is true not only for their clients or patients, but also for their staff who sometimes need the same types of support. DV programs can attend to health needs for survivors and their children entering DV programs um, or by calling hotlines and increase their health access by providing referrals to a partnering health center. And health centers can improve health and safety outcomes for survivors accessing health centers and can promote universal education messaging around intimate partner violence and human trafficking, which we'll talk about shortly, and can provide a referral if needed to the partnering DV program. The staff from both agencies can also benefit from this par partnership perso personally as they themselves may need this type of support for themselves, friends, or family members. And children can also benefit from these partnerships by removing barriers to health and mental health services, which can include trauma-informed interventions and child well visits. And with that, I'm going to pass it to my colleague, Anna. Thanks, Anissa. Next slide, please. Thanks. So right now, as many of you know on the line and also may be a part of, health centers have been getting up and running with telehealth, offering patient visits remotely by either screen or phone. And because of the isolation that Leana described earlier, healthcare providers really might be the first and perhaps only person reaching out to a patient or the first person the patient has been allowed to speak to outside of their home. And in fact, you might also be the only person who has shared a kind word with that patient in the past few weeks or months. So we really see this as an opportunity to reach out and support survivors of violence and exploitation using telehealth, but we also recognize the reasons that some people may not feel safe disclosing abuse or trafficking. So we want to spend the next few minutes offering you a universal education approach which can reach all patients with information about healthy and abusive relationships and exploitation and where they can go for more information or for help. And we call this approach cues. Next slide, please. So in order to talk about uh, violence or exploitation with patients but decrease risk, we do recommend offering a universal education approach on IPV and trafficking and in place um, of a screening tool that poses yes, no questions to a patient. This practice shift is really critical for patients who may have a long history of distrust in systems or who may fear further violence or harm um, in terms of answering the question and really just are unable to say yes or talk openly about what's going on. So looking at the slide, Q stands for each step of the intervention. Confidentiality and making patients aware of any limitations, universal education on both IPV and exploitation, empowerment, which is sharing information not only with the patient but also as something that they can share with family or friends. And then support, which includes making those connections to local advocacy programs, as Anissa talked about, and also sharing validating messages for those who do choose to disclose. And while cues is typically done during in-person health visits using a brochure or a little safety card some of you might be familiar with, we've adapted it now for telehealth with some enhanced scripting that we'll share with you. Next slide, please. So while today I'm not going to get into um, all of the actions that are associated with cues, you can learn more online on our online toolkit, ipvhealthpartners.org, which will walk you through each of the steps in more detail and provide you with additional guidance, like the types you can see listed here on the slide, which includes things like pointers to enhance patient privacy during virtual um, health visits, sample scripts. Uh, providing guidance on universal education and how to respond to disclosures. And we also, uh, you know, consider principles like how to enhance patient privacy and ways to share resources safely, as well as pointers for patients to enhance their own privacy, thinking about their digital footprint. Another big piece of guidance that we offer on the online toolkit is what Anissa was talking about, which is how health centers can really partner closely with local domestic violence programs. And this will really support the way 
that your staff are offering those warm uh, bi-directional referrals to one another's programs. And at the same time, letting your patients know a little bit about what the local domestic violence program offers and the role of an advocate and how to reach them. Next slide, please. So many of you who are um, either healthcare practitioners or healthcare staff are already opening your patient visits with COVID-19 related questions, as well as acknowledging with your patients, as Liana talked about, that it's really just a hard time for all of us right now and that the stress can feel overwhelming. And a conversation like this can also serve as a bridge to then discuss intimate partner violence. So on the slide is one sample script, which I'll read um, at this time. Because of the stress, we are sharing information about resources that are available, for example, we may experience stress in our relationships, including increased fighting or harm, and that can affect our health and parenting. There's a free confidential help available to you or someone you know, um, if someone you know is being hurt or is being hurt in the relationship. So of course, um, you know, you can adapt that script to fit your own language, your own style, and just know that trusting the patient to help be a public health advocate and share the information with their friends and family really helps them heal, it helps others, and ensures that they have the information if they need it, you know, anytime down the line, but perhaps, perhaps can't disclose to you in your, um, you know, over the phone or in a telehealth visit. Providers can still ask direct questions and state any concerns they may have for the patient, um, but you've also opened up a space there for the patient to disclose or not, and again, um, the provider should always ask if it's okay uh, before following up with resources, whether they're in the mail or a text or an email. You want to make sure that, that that works for them and that's a safe way to reach them. Next slide, please. So on this slide, similarly, you can see a sample script on providing universal education related to human trafficking, and I'll read it. Many people are also feeling pressure around money and paying rent or bills. Sometimes others take advantage of people for work and also for sex. So we're sharing information about resources that are available if you find yourself in a situation like this. Can I give you unemployment resources, housing and food support, and other things to share if you know someone who needs it? And again, that script can be adapted. You can put it in your own um, language, fit your own style, but it's something to build from. And you'll notice that in both of these scripts, while we don't talk about domestic violence or human trafficking, we're getting at some of the key dynamics that are more relatable to many people. And we know that human trafficking is an issue that affects the most vulnerable people, those who are looking to earn a basic living and just survive. So the economic conditions of today put many more people at risk for this type of exploitation. So both of the scripts I offered are intended to highlight some of the additional stressors during COVID-19. And in this case, a provider could follow up with resources and hotlines, you know, associated with food and housing, job or economic support, as well as domestic violence and national trafficking hotlines or resources. And you can bundle this as a group so that um, it's not pointed that you're just sending them trafficking or domestic violence resources in isolation. Next slide, please. So the E in Q stands for empowerment. And this is really the opportunity to share information with patients that they can also share with their friends and family. And more and more the science is telling us that altruism heals and that tapping into the patient as a resource for their community is important. You can see on the slide this recent New York Times article highlights a number of studies that demonstrate how helping others, whether it's volunteering, donating money or giving advice is beneficial for people's well-being and can actually increase their resilience. And this is especially important during COVID-19 when people and especially survivors are experiencing increased levels of stress and feelings of helplessness. Not only do they receive the info for themselves, but it can also be healing to share with others. Next slide, please. So how do we measure success? Success is not measured by fixing people's problems or telling people what to do, but rather in the ways that we reduce isolation and improve health and safety outcomes for survivors. And one of the foundational actions to operationalize this goal is to establish or expand partnerships between health centers and DV advocacy programs, which we've detailed today. 
So as a first step, community health centers can begin by identifying your own local domestic violence program or programs and including them as part of your care team. One way uh, is to do this is to visit the National Coalition Against Domestic Violence's website where they have a complete list of all of the state and territory coalitions. And those coalitions include member programs, member local domestic violence programs all across their state. And so you can look there at that listing as one way to identify your own local program. When you do so, reach out, get to know their staff, find out what services they provide, especially now during COVID-19. And you can also find sample MOUs and other tools to help establish those relationships at IPV Health Partners. Also know that the National Domestic Violence Hotline can also connect you or a patient directly to a local program. They can actually patch you in over the phone to that local program. Also, there's the Strong Hearts Helpline, which offers culturally appropriate domestic violence and dating violence support for Native Americans. The National Runaway Safe Line is a helpline for both youth and parents in crisis and runaway and homeless youth. And lastly, the National Human Trafficking Hotline is available for trafficking survivors via phone or text. And just a note that in the webinar platform, you can see the little box for files, and there's a number of handouts there. One of them includes the sample scripts that I just shared with you, as well as other systems change pointers, and some other ideas in terms of establishing partnerships between your health center and your domestic violence program. So take a look at that. We're now going to shift gears, and we're going to hear from Dr. Kimberly Chang, who is going to share with us some of the ways that her health center in Oakland, California, is adapting their care for survivors of domestic violence and trafficking. And I just want to extend um, our sincere gratitude to Dr. Chang and all the others on this webinar, both healthcare providers and domestic violence advocates and others who are working on th this topic, who, like Dr. Chang, has continued to provide care to your patients or your clients during coronavirus, despite the risk that this really poses to your own health and perhaps to your friends and family who are close to you as well. So. Just our humble gratitude to Dr. Chang and all of you on the line who are first responders. Um, and it's my pleasure now to turn it over to Dr. Chang. Thank you. Hey, thanks so much, everybody. And thanks so much, Anna. I think I, I hear you uh, banging uh, some pots and pans at 7 p.m. every night. Anyway, thank you for Anna and Futures and to our federal partners for inviting me to share Asian Health Services experiences today. Uh, most importantly, like uh, Liana uh, expressed, I want to thank all of the listeners because each of you can be a lifeline to vulnerable people in your community. So thank you for listening and learning a little bit today. A little background about Asian Health Services. We're a community health center, a federally qualified health center in Oakland, California. We serve 50,000 patients in the East Bay area where they're providers of choice and also we're the safety net for high quality primary care in 14 different Asian languages and cultures. Just like the uh, approximately 1,400 other FQHCs and health centers across the country, we provide a wide range of really crucial health care services, primary care, dental care, mental health, youth programs, community outreach, and advocacy. At Asian Health Services, like other health centers, we see each of our patients as a whole person and not just a case or an illness. So what this means is that most often there are multiple issues present, from poverty to language barriers, isolation to domestic violence, and even discrimination. Our safety net extends to our sister nonprofits in the community as we intentionally refer and bring in supports and create partnerships like this Project Catalyst from other services like legal aid, social services, food banks, elder care, and, and more. I want to share now some general trends of what we've been hearing and seeing on the front lines of care. We had a staff meeting a couple weeks ago of almost 500 people on a Zoom. Can you believe that? Can you imagine that? Um, and it was really, really engaging with chats and breakout room discussions. We asked our staff to share some of the most compelling patient stories from the front lines. As we reach out and connect with our patients, we've witnessed the firsthand impact of self-isolation among our elderly, heightened stress among our families and adults. We've seen a high demand and significant increase in mental health counseling, telehealth visits, after we swiftly and rapidly transformed the majority of our in-person visits to virtual phone and video care, critical lifelines for our most vulnerable patients. One woman, one patient, attempted suicide, triggered by being kicked off of her insurance. 
the financial pressures and, and family discords. Uh, those diagnosed uh, with HIV, some of our HIV patients are petrified to go out for supplies and medications given their co uh, compromised immune systems. Others have, have, have shared that they're unable to self-isolate because they're essential workers at grocery stores, as personal care aides to the elderly, as delivery drivers, working in takeout restaurants, as warehouse workers, and they can't afford to lose their job because their boss disallows sick leave. Our teen program is getting desperate pleas from youth, afraid of going hungry. They're out of school and, and many are without any stable source of hot meals or income. Patients with severe chronic illnesses and cancer are no longer able to afford their medications. Many have lost their jobs. They face language barriers and filling out unemployment forms, and they fear the potential health care costs of contracting COVID. At the same time, you may have heard about the fuel, the, this fuel of anti-Asian racism that's risen in our society. We had a patient wearing a mask who was told to sit at the back of the bus to a youth bullied because he was associated with the, quote, Chinese virus, to rocks thrown at another child while she rode her bike while the perpetrators screamed and yelled at her, corona, corona. So in terms of violence, all of these issues and general trends impact and have shown an increase in the general trends of domestic violence and risk of exploitation amongst our patients. The violence doesn't occur in isolation of these issues. Our staff have definitely noted this increase in escalating uh, domestic violence situations. One staff recounts making a police report to request a welfare check on a, on a situation, domestic violence situation. The patient later expressed really sincere appreciation for the welfare check because it made the abuser perpetrator realize that he is being monitored by support systems like us and that we're watching out for her safety. Another patient reached out to our HIV counselors to say her husband had been abusing her since COVID-19, and the counselors have worked with our partners to help relieve the abusive situation and get alternative housing. And still another patient expressed that her husband was angry, angry all the time, more angry, and, um, and, and she's afraid because he has more than 30 guns in the house. Over and over again, the themes that emerge from the patients during this time of COVID and shelter in place is that patients' home and violence situations are worsened because patients are worried about three things, children, money, and housing. As you heard from the previous speakers, COVID has worsened all of these things and is showing up much more starkly in the clinical setting. In terms of exploitation, financial situations are making everything harder for patients already living precariously uh, um, on the edge. Um, on the edge of not having enough money to get basic needs met. We had a youth patient living in foster care who days after shelter in place went into effect was transferred to a different county to another foster shelter. Our counselors and outside partners noted this youth patient somehow was getting a lot of money without having a job that they knew of, and they're concerned that this youth is at much higher risk of forced sexual exploitation. They're continuing to find out more information and working with folks in, in, in her new county. Some of these challenges we're facing are similar to pre-COVID challenges. They're workforce challenges where patients want a female counselor or staff, but only male staff are available that day or maybe not available right away. There are issues of language and culturally specific resources with our partner organizations. For example, we work very closely with the Asian Women's Shelter, and that's based in San Francisco. It's a separate county from us in Alameda. And as we well know, oftentimes shelters have limited availability and this is worsened by COVID, and then compounded by language barriers, and sometimes our patients have even li more limited resources available to them. We don't have any language concordant services in my county, so geographic limitations are there as well. Issues of isolation already well known in our population due to anti-immigrant stigma, language and cultural barriers, poverty, uh, these are all magnified during this time. So lots of challenges that are amplified and lots of new challenges uh, too, in terms of delivering care, outreaching, providing accurate and timely information to these already marginalized uh, communities. It's crucially important that health centers mobilize because COVID affects everyone and even more so in the vulnerable populations that we serve. So in response during this time of COVID, we've had to rapidly develop new services and transform our operations to safer ways of connecting, monitoring, outreaching, and delivering care. Like other health centers across the country, we literally overnight, probably like many of you, 
shifted to mostly telehealth audio and video services across all departments. We are rapidly employing our network to reach out to patients and non-patient community members to provide the necessary lifeline to our most vulnerable. Education and outreach through our new WeChat. WeChat is a, is a, is a uh, social media that's popular in Asian communities. Uh, we, we have a new WeChat account, social me media initiatives such as an Asian Pacific Islander YouTube channel, a multilingual COVID-19 hotline, telehealth and teletouch uh, services, remote health monitoring equipment like um, portable pulse oximeters, and special iPads for seniors and high-risk patients that don't require Wi-Fi. In terms of our violence prevention and intervention protocols, we're continuing our internal operations teams and getting the training out on the cues intervention. So we're doing this all uh, virtually uh, um, through Zoom and such. We've streamlined and modify, modified our warm handoff to our integrated behavioral health teams with the manager and supervisor getting all the referrals so they can touch and are aware of every single patient needing services at this time. And they're triaging and assessing the acuity level of intervention needed. We've developed for us in, an inter, internal crisis hotline of support for the providers and staff to reach the more expert behavioral health and case management team since we're all no longer in the same physical space. Our case management department is organizing meal delivery for seniors, helping patients apply for unemployment insurance, helping patients with rent negotiations. Patients without computers or, or who aren't IT savvy are getting help over the phone to set up online applications. Our case managers are doing it for them online and they're having to navigate lots of boundaries and ethical issues, so we're developing internal policies around these types of services. We're proactively and systematically outreaching to our vulnerable patients and populations. Our community programs, like our community liaison unit, our youth programs, and Bante Sre, which is our program for youth at risk of sexual exploitation, we're working with our outside partners, like the, the domestic violence programs, legal aid, cultural organizations, and other youth programs to strengthen the safety net holding up our patients and communities. Um, on, a, on a higher level, our Alameda County Community Health Center Network, which is a consortium of all the health centers in, in our county, we're embarking on developing countywide health center protocols with sharing and intentional equitable collaboration with other social service partners, including the domestic violence programs, to specifically address violence across the health centers for our patients. So there's a lot going on, and we're actively responding and thinking through the future operations for our patients. One last thing I want to mention, uh, and this is some cultural competency here, while this is a huge crisis for everyone across the globe, it's also a key time for rising to the challenge and creating new and hopefully better ways of providing care. Um, in Chinese, the word for crisis is actually composed of two characters, which individually mean danger and opportunity. So let's meet our challenges and seize the opportunity to be better going forward. Thanks, everyone, for your time and, most, most importantly, your care for people. And now I'll turn it over to Mie. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Chang. Your programs sound amazing. Um, thank you so much for sharing. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Mie Sakuda, and I'm a program manager at Futures Without Violence in the Children and Youth team. Thank you so much for having me today. I'm so grateful to be here. So now we're going to sh take a little shift and talk a little bit about children who are experiencing domestic violence and ways we can support them and their healing. It isn't, I'll start by saying it, it isn't uncommon to see children and young people left out of the conversation of domestic violence response because it is unfortunately still a common belief that children are not impacted by domestic violence and that they're too young to understand what's going on, and that the younger the child, the more likely they will not remember the violence. However, as many or all of you already know, children are definitely affected by domestic violence, although not all children are impacted in the same way. And even though individual variability in children has something to do with this, it is definitely not the full picture. The science in our own experiences tell us that context matters, specifically the experiences, conditions, and systems that children are exposed to. They all have the potential to either buffer the impacts of adversity and trauma or to accentuate its impacts. And even though we know about the harmful impacts domestic violence have, can have on children, the story doesn't have to end there. Children can heal, and we have a huge role in creating the context in which healing can happen. Uh, next slide, please. 
So let's talk about protective factors. You know, when folks start talking about why certain children respond differently to adversity, particularly why some children overcome the hard things they've experienced in life and why other children can't, um, folks reference the role of nature versus nurture. So how much, the question is how much of a role does the person's specific traits and attributes have on their ability to heal versus the conditions and environments they grow up and live within? And we now know from the science that it's actually both uh, nature and nurture, and that it's the same when we talk about protective factors. So protective factors, I like to think about them on two levels. So on one level, it's about individual people healing from the trauma of domestic violence and its effects that it has, the trauma's effects it has on us, both by, are on three, three domains, biologically, psychologically, and socially. And on a different level, what we as providers working in organizations and systems can do to reverse the negative effects of trauma and encourage, uh, amplify, advance, and sustain the healing process of individuals. So a key takeaway here is that there are concrete steps and organizing principles like the ones uh, Leona spoke to at the beginning of the presentation that we can use to design policy, programs, and practices that can help bolster individual attributes and also create the environments and conditions that promote healthy development, foster recovery, support healing, and ensure well-being and thriving, which is what we ultimately want for everybody. Next slide, please. So what you're seeing on the screen is a graphic that we created to visually represent five interrelated protective factors specific to children and uh, adult survivors of domestic violence that we know from research and science buffer the negative impacts of domestic violence and promote healing for both adult and child survivors of domestic violence. This is a product that uh, we created through our Quality Improvement Center on Domestic Violence and Child Welfare, which is a national research project of Futures, of Futures uh, funded by the Children's Bureau. And um, more information is actually in the downloadable file. There's a brief that you can read that has more information on the protective factors. But as you can see, um, there I think these are heptagons, but these heptagons are connected um, in the graphic, which is meant to convey that these protective factors create a sort of uh, ecosystem of wellness and growth. The five factors represent the types of experiences and conditions that benefit and protect survivors of domestic violence from immediate and short um, and long-term harm. And it's worth pointing out that the protective factors are interdependent, which means that when you are promoting one protective factor, you're actually also laying the foundation for strengthening the other protective factors as well. So the five protective factors are uh, safer and more stable conditions for survivors, uh, social, cultural, and spiritual connections, resilience and a growth mindset, nurturing parent-child interactions, and social and emotional abilities. Um, so again, if you are interested in learning more, please uh, check out our brief. Next slide, please. So now um, I'm going to go from the ecosystem kind of conversation down to more of the specifics. So I'm introducing you to our five healing gestures. These uh, gestures come out of our Changing Minds initiative and um, stems from the same body of research and sites that we've been talking about that help to promote healing for children experiencing domestic violence. These are more kind of like uh, concrete things you or any adult uh, who are working or interacting with children um, can do to create uh, positive interpersonal interactions that help create uh, positive experiences for children and support the, their healthy development. So the five gestures are to comfort children, listen to them, inspire them, collaborate with them, and celebrate them. One of the things that we like to do with groups when we talk about gestures is ask folks to share ideas and experiences about how they've actioned out some of these gestures because um, there's just so many ways that you can, for example, comfort uh, someone, listen to them, right? So it's a great learning opportunity to kind of hear from people what uh, they do to kind of demonstrate these gestures. So since we can't do that now, I encourage people to uh, take some time after the webinar and think about uh, how you personally 
uh, have and would action out these gestures and maybe ask colleagues and other folks for ideas because it's just, uh, I think it's a great learning opportunity. Uh, next slide, please. So I'm going to start uh, <laughs> referencing my favorite Sesame Street. I love Sesame Street. They have great resources for families and providers. Uh, there are two videos that I highly encourage folks to check out if you haven't already. The first one is called Traumatic Experiences, um, and the second is Big Bird's Comfy Cozy Nest. These both kind of speak to the power of relationships and the powerful role that we can play in supporting children, um, children's healing. And they do that through these two characters, which is Big Bird and Alan. Um, and then next slide, please. Uh, on their website, um, they have a ton of other resources that I think is really helpful, at least for me. So I encourage the whole group to please check out their Sesame Street Communities website. Uh, they have topic-specific resources, one specifically on trauma, and then now they also have a COVID-19 topic issue uh, website as well. Next slide, please. Uh, so before I pass it to Kenya to close us out, I just want to highlight our two national resource centers. The first one is our National Health Resource Center on DV, um, where we provide tools and technical assistance to improve healthcare's response to DV and sexual violence and increase healthcare access to survivors within community-based programs. And then our second is our Promising Futures Capacity Building Center, uh, where we do similar things. We have resources and provide technical assistance for agencies that are building programming and services for children and parents experiencing domestic violence. And we lean um, heavily on the principles that we spoke to and uplifting the power of parent-child relationships. So with that, I will pass it over to Kenya. Thank you. Thanks, Mie, Liana, Dr. Chang, and Anna, um, and just everyone for your presentations today. They were fantastic, and I really enjoyed um, hearing the content and seeing the chat um, that's and the conversations and dialogue that's happening there. So thank you all so much for that, and thank you again to Commissioner Darling and to Commander Matone Smith for sharing those amazing welcoming remarks. Um, it was so heartfelt to hear about um, the passion and the dedication for this work and what's happening. So I just want to point out a couple of resources um, that we have that we really encourage you all to take some time to review and to also share with your colleagues. And then I'll pass it over to Jane to make closing comments to close us out. So you can see here on the slide um, that we have one toolkit that we are, have been really proud of um, that has come out of Project Catalyst as well as our work with the Health Resource Center on Domestic Violence, and that is ITVHealthPartners.org. This is a toolkit that was developed with community health center input and experience, and it includes resources for health centers and domestic violence organizations to form partnerships. Um, it also provides a step-by-step -step information and guidance on how to implement the interventions that we've discussed and that have been talked about today on this webinar session. Um, there's also some very practical, actionable steps, scripts, training curricula, templates and other quality assurance and quality imp improvement tools that are available. So please take a moment to check it out. Um, and the, the URL is very easy to remember, ipvhealthpartners.org. Also, I want to share um, the FIPSA and HRSA, OWH. We regularly partner with the um, HHS Office of Trafficking in Persons, um, and some of our colleagues may have been on the webinar today. So we wanted to make sure to uplift their COVID-19 resource page. Um, the HHS OTIP Office works to prevent human trafficking and to ensure that children and adults who have experienced trafficking in their families get the support and care they need to live safe and healthy lives. So on the OTIP resources page, um, they do provide information regarding disruptions to housing, economic stability, and social disconnection, which can further increase the risk of victimization and exploitation for human trafficking victims and also for survivors. So with that, um, I will pass it over to Jane to make our closing remarks for the webinar. Great. Thank you so much, Kenya. So in closing, we are sharing contact information for leadership in FIPSA, the HRSA Office of Women's Health, and the HRSA Office of Regional Operations, Region 9. You'll be able to revisit this information and find resources shared by downloading today's slides. We'll also mail out the slides and a recording of the webinar. And please reach out at any time to further discuss the topics covered in today's webinar. Um, our next slide.
We encourage you to learn more about HRSA at hrsa.gov. You can also subscribe to our e-newsletter to stay informed about events such as today's webinar. And just a sincere thank you to today's speakers and everyone who joined today. Thank you for the work you are leading as first responders, providers, and advocates for your patients, clients, um, communities, families, and children. Our gratitude to you all and continue to be well. Thank you. Thank you. That does conclude today's conference. Thank you all for participating. You may now disconnect.